Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger and yet another episode in my 12 plus years of doing radio and podcasts. My question to you is, where's your visibility? Out into the world, that's what I do. And what I know about what I do and what's interesting about what I do and probably about what you do is, hmm, originally there was a core wound for me around visibility. And isn't it fascinating that it would be in my soul's DNA that it's the very thing I disseminate out into the world. So how I do that is I am a book writing coach. It's such a mouthful to say that. I help you write your darn book is really what I'm saying. And I help you turn it into a page turner. Just got a new client yesterday that I'm super excited about and his story that he's going to tell out into the world. And so I do privates, I do groups around writing your book. Also, I've got a company that guarantees your book fully done for you goes to international bestseller. Just got a great testimony from a lawyer that I've been working with, somebody very prominent who's been on CNN. And he wrote me this beautiful testimony thanking me for the launch I just did for him last week. He said that it buoyed him so much. He's getting a lot of television interviews. He's going to Wall Street Journal bestseller now. It bumped up his numbers so much. It's so It's good and gooder. And I love hearing success stories like that. And the final piece that I deliver around visibility is about you being interviewed. Because if you have a business and a message, you must want to be visible because being visible means your tribe gets to find you. So I teach the ultimate visibility program. It's a formula. Everybody who goes through it is successful. In fact, while they're going through the program, they start being interviewed in real time. And so we're going to be rolling out a new class. Go to ultimate visibility formula, and that's located Debbie D, D E B B I D dot net slash visibility. And I'm going to also share a little behind the scenes and hopefully more with my guest today because that is our subject du jour. And that's precisely where I'm starting here. You know, I was very aware of the wounds I had and very aware of the irony and uh, the perfection of how I would start where I did having this difficulty about aligning myself fully with being heard and seen. I want to be really clear. Starting from the time I was terribly young, I mean really young, I was on stage. I was a, an actress and a singer for the majority of my life until I had a change 12 years ago and radio and books and being on stage in a different way took over. But what I want you to know is concurrent with my feeling most at home in front of a camera and a microphone and being on stage in a spotlight, concurrent with that were these terribly awkward, belittling thoughts that I live with all the time, which drumbeat mantra said over and over is, you are not worthy, you don't belong here, no one wants to hear you. And boy, was doesn't that make it awkward then when you're trying to speak to people because you're constantly judging yourself and saying, nobody really wants to hear what I'm saying and I'm saying things at the same time. Not good. So lots of healing I've had to do over the years, over the many years so that it became clear that it's incumbent on me to take the mic and the spotlight. And I got just another piece last week was Rhythmia, and, and you know you've heard the people who run Rhythmia on the show, but a really huge piece that I got at Rhythmia that really surprised me. You know, at Rhythmia, you set intentions before you drink the plant medicine. I got so darn tired of setting intentions. I went out to the shaman and I thought, oh, heck, just anything that's in the way, let me know about it so we can get it out of the way and I could be all that I came here to be. And some people would say, yikes, be careful what you wish for. But you know, I love playing big. I have to say, pain sucks. I'm not about pain. I really am not. In fact, I'll run the other way into the light. So it's like, whatever it is, bring it. And boy, did they. Grandmother Medicine was not messing around and she showed me a big one. I'm not going to share it in this interview because it'll be off topic, but I want to say it was huge. I work with a shaman because it was so big. I needed some, some love and help uh, from the universe and the outside. And they were a hundred percent right there with me. And boy, the gestalt of releasing that from my system, something I had buried so deep away. But when it was all done, this is sort of very perfect for my personality, and all the gestalt was over, I looked up at the shaman and said, guess what I teach out in the world? Visibility. 
and we just were roaring with laughter. He was so appreciative that I have this quirky personality that could go from total tears to hilarious laughter all in the same moment. But I knew in that moment I had taken a split part of me back inside of myself, fully healed, and that I was going to be able to show up even more prominently serving people in the spotlight, as well as helping you to become more visible. So to that end, I just want to thank you for joining me in the show every week. And thank you so much for your comments. I read all of them. And you know I answer you back because I love you for letting me know how the guests and how this show affects you and the things you're creating. I also want to thank Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness for sponsoring this show. They do tremendous energy work out into the world, anywhere in the world, any country you can find them. Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R, as well as accessconsciousness.com. And also, this show has been nominated for two people's podcast choice awards if you love this show and i suggest you do leave us a review subscribe so it comes right into your inbox you don't even have to look for it if you want to subscribe just a few places you can go to so it's really easy we're in at least 40 different outlets some of the mage ones i can name are apple and google podcasts spreaker youtube bbs radio pandora iHeartRadio, leave a review, and thank you so much for being a part of the Dare to Dream team. So visibility, what if you could release those core wounds, those triggers, those patterns that have been keeping you from the success you desire? What if you could actually have the inner freedom and the success, the peace that you so desire? My guest today is Patrick Dominguez. He's here to talk about the visibility wounds banishing the fear of being seen, and I might add to that, also being heard. Because if personal development is something that you're in, and hey, you're my tribe, so clearly, it is what you do all the time, inner growth, but maybe you're throwing money at books, maybe you're throwing money at workshops, maybe you're feeling something in the interim and walking away and in the long term going, nothing's really working. Well, he's gonna share his inner freedom process. Patrick is also the co-founder of The Big Shift, working with business owners around the world and growing their impact. And he developed a revolutionary inner freedom process based on 10 years of working with entrepreneurs and leaders as well as his own transformational journey. At Wisdom 2.0, Patrick takes you through a four-step method so you can have a continuous experience of self-love, peace and feeling secure from the inside rather than perpetually seeking it on the outside. His website to learn more is innerfreedomprocess.com. My friend, Patrick, it is so great to have you. Welcome to Dare to Dream. Hello, Debbie, and hello, everybody. It's so fantastic to be here. Well, I met you at a summit that we were at together and we immediately connected. Um, And I'm so grateful now for knowing you. And I was gifted by you with this process. We had an experience. So I appreciate I'm able to talk to the audience also from a point of view. I have had a session. So I've got an idea. But for those who don't know what it is, what is inner freedom process. And if you don't mind a little backstory, how did it even come about? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, let's definitely start with the backstory. So, uh, uh, so I've been building a coaching business for the last 10 years with my business partner, Bill Barron. And, you know, we've built this uh, coaching business up to a business doing almost $5 million in revenue a year and working with clients all over the world, change agents and uh, people doing good in the world, entrepreneurs. But people always think, oh, you were able to build that sort of business. There must be something you know, very special or unique about you. But what a lot of people don't know is when I first started coaching, it was a lot like other coaches where I was kind of scrabbling to get clients. You know, My goal was just to have you know, a handful of clients to start working with. And uh, it was a very humble beginning. And, uh, How long was it humble for? <laughs> way too long. I would say for a year or two, it was very, very humble. Uh, and 
the thing is when, you know, when I started out, probably like most coaches, I know this is what we advise our coaches, you know, the advice that coaches and other, you know, transformational agents usually get is if you want to get clients, if you want to be able to help people in the world, you have to go out and get in front of people. Mm. Right. And that's big. I just want to, as an aside, that is so big because so many people don't. They don't yeah. want to go to networking. They don't want to speak on stage. They don't want to go. Maybe they'll go to events and participate, but the other stuff that has to do with visibility is off their list. Yeah. And, you know, so for me, I came to coaching after having worked in the corporate world and basically working for other companies for 16 years. And so visibility wasn't really a thing, you know, if you're an employee of larger companies or even smaller companies, usually it might be the head or the leadership of the company that has what you might really think of as visibility. Uh, and so that wasn't really in my background to be visible or to cultivate a brand. You know, maybe I'd present something at a meeting, but uh, wasn't really like being visible as, you know, patrickdominguez.com or something. So, so when I shifted from mostly really just being invisible as a you know member of a, a company, uh, maybe visible to my team, but not visible to the public. And so when it came to being visible to a, a wider public, uh, that's a, a completely different animal. Yeah, I think you shared with me that at some point while you were working with Bill, it became incumbent upon you to get up on stage. And will you share a little bit about what happened in your space about speaking from stage? Oh God. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, so the conventional wisdom, if you're building a coaching business or a, you know, transformational oriented business, a healing business is speak in front of people, right? Cause then you get to present yourself as an expert, right? You get to educate people. And when they learn about what you do, then they're interested in talking to you more and possibly working with you, hiring you. And so this is pretty common wisdom. However, for me, I was, you know, scared to death of actually getting on a stage and speaking in front of people and just like really terrified at the idea. And so it basically had been avoiding it. And of course, there's the cost of avoiding that, right? If you're avoiding it, then you're not in front of people and you're not really generating business and you're not doing what you want to be doing, right? So that's kind of where I was, was mostly not getting that many clients because uh, I was, you know, not really visible. And so... Bill and I decided let's have an event. So we decided to have an event called the Big Shift Experience. And the first year we had 60 people come and it was a two day event and we had divided things up. Bill was gonna present some sessions, I was gonna present some sessions. And when it was my turn, oh man, I was just sweating so much. And I'm not like someone who really sweats that much. Even when I go to the gym, I don't sweat that much. But when I was on that stage, I was just sweating bullets. My shirt got so soaked, I had to switch. Oh, no. I had to put on, I had to get a different shirt at the event. You know, it was close enough in color, probably people didn't notice like there was some costume change or something. But, uh, and then, uh, you know, I used to be the sort of person where everything had to be scripted out line by line, but then it's hard to f remember everything. So uh, then I'm forgetting what I was supposed to say in the middle of my session and so forth. And you know, it was pretty, it was a pretty miserable experience. Uh, I, you know, I, I think I did not do a great job. You know, Bill tried to pat me on the back and my business partner and say, oh, you know, you did fine and so forth. But I was like, I think I dragged the event down. And, mm. uh, and mainly I was feeling after that kind of like PTSD, like totally. I kind of I never want to do that again. And you're such a good person. Like you're really such a good human that I can imagine you must have really taken the weight of that upon yourself, like way more than an average person. Oh, yeah, I was apologizing to Bill multiple times, like, I'm sorry for dragging the event down. I'm sorry. You know, I'm glad. Thank you for being, you know, such a rock and doing so great and compensating for me doing such a horrible job there. And, uh, and even though he tried to like, say, yeah, you know, you did fine. And so forth. I'm like, No, I, I know I didn't. And I think objectively, like it was not great. You know, so wasn't even just being hard on myself. And so, uh, uh, so we decided a year later, let's do the big shift experience again. And I was in charge of all the marketing for the event. And, uh, you know, it's crazy because uh, our business was growing at the time. And so we had double the number of people come the next year. So we had 120 people. And so, you know, Debbie created the situation where basically the more people were signing up, 
the more I was dreading sure. going to the event. Yep. And so, you know, the worst thing you could do in your business is create something that you're dreading, you know, so it's kind of this <laughs> weird situation where I was in charge of it. I love the event concept, right? The big shift experience, helping people experience big shifts, like right then and there at the event. But like, the, the closer we got, the more people were signing up, the more I'm like, oh, this is going to be horrible. There's going to be twice as many people as last year, which normally, like if you're running a marketing department, you're excited. You're like goodness. double the people like, you know, home run, like, you know, we rocked it. And so that's, that's when I said, okay, you know, I just don't want to have a business where I'm seriously dreading like our biggest event of the year, you know, and that just, there's something about that just seemed fundamentally wrong. Yeah. So you know intimately what it's like to have a visibility wound. Clearly you work through it. I know you've come to the other side. Um, you don't have to sweat through shirts anymore. You don't have to dread like manifest and then dread what you're manifesting at the same time. I know you've come very, very far. So I actually like that you know what it's like to have a visibility wound because I just feel for the work I do out in the world, it's important that I know what my clients go through. And I feel that when I'm going to hire someone. So where did inner freedom process come from? Is it something you culled from different modalities? Is it something that was a download for you? Yeah. So, so this inner freedom work uh, started with things like me healing my own or I, at the time, it was finding people who could help me heal this visibility wound, this fear of being visible. And I hired, you know, eight different people, you know, all sorts of healers, coaches, experts to try to help me. And ultimately, when it when it worked, and when I was able to go to one of our events and go on stage and just feel comfortable and ultimately free, like free to be me, free to say what I want to say and not be afraid of what's going to happen. Uh, I thought, wow, this is such a powerful transformation. And then in working, you know, I've coached hundreds of entrepreneurs and it's very common people have visibility wounds or other sorts of wounds holding them back in their businesses. And so I just got very passionate about not only how do I help, you know, because coaching in a lot of ways is about helping someone get from A to B. You know, they're here, they don't really want to be here, they want to be there. And so coaching tends to be mostly what are the action steps I need to take to get from where I am to where I want to go. But that's the action steps, the strategies and so forth, the tactics are only one half of the picture. The other half of the picture is, well, what's going inside of you on yes. that journey? And you know what, by definition, if you're doing something ambitious, if you're stepping out of your comfort zone, there's going to be resistance, right? Totally. Ambitious goals and resistance go together. And so the question is, what are you doing to work with the resistance or the fear or the inner blocks that come up? And so as a coach myself, and I could see this was typical in the coaching world, is most coaches, you know, were pretty good or really good at helping people move forward with action steps. But then when people's stuff would come up, coaches want to kind of avoid that, shy away from that. And like, oh, how can I help this client move forward without having to get into this messy stuff. And I got to the point where I realized if I can't help a client with the quote unquote messier stuff or the stuff that comes up, then there's a lot of people that are just going to stay stuck and I'm not really helping. Yes. I am so supporting what you're saying and pleased to hear you say this. This is exactly why I do what I do with my clients. It is inner and outer work. There is no way I can teach anybody the technical strategy. I can get them booked on shows, but there's something up. I, I have found even with people who are massively successful, seemingly on the outside, that everybody's got their ceiling and there's a place they get to where stuff comes up. Of course, you and I know it comes up to be healed. It's actually a gift, but it's very uncomfortable when you're in it because you're aware of it, but not how to actuate it out into the world. Like, okay, I'm hitting the ceiling this sucks. I don't want to be here. I'm aware it's here, but I don't know how to access this and make it into something that works for it, for me to transform it, to heal this piece that's holding me back. So this is huge. <clears throat> so around visibility, there are core wounds and they operate for people on in different places and spaces and they all look quite different. What are the signs? What signs do you know 
exists that people might hear you talk about right now where they can say, oh, I have that one or I have that one? Yeah. So by the way, uh, in my work with people, uh, I have a system where there's five different types of wounds that interfere with people's ability to make progress in business, also in love and in other pursuits in their life. So there's these five core wounds and one of them is the visibility wound. And there's four other ones actually. Uh, but just talking about the visibility wound. So along with the visibility wound, there's usually fear of failure, fear, fear of feeling like a fraud, fear of being found out, uh, uh, fear of not being good enough or feeling like they're not good enough. But I would say, especially like to me, the hallmark of the visibility wound is a feeling of if I'm visible, then blank. And I just want to encourage people who are listening right now to us, just, you know, if, if someone's listening to this right now, there's, there's a decent chance they're aware of a visibility wound for themselves. And so give us just, some blanks. So if I'm visible, then well, first, what? if you're listening, just think, see what's the first thing that comes up, right? If I'm visible, then blank, what happens? Okay. Can I give you a really weird one? Yeah. So like, while you're talking, I had something pop up and I'm like, wow. I had no idea. This is one I've been aware of for so long and stymied by. Okay, but I'm, let, I'm letting it rip. So one of my goals, I've actually shared this with you. One of my biggest values is world travel. And I have traveled even since I'm a kid. You know, I've gone lots of places. But compared to my heart's desire, oh, nothing like what I really want to travel the world and I've been well aware for the longest time, the thing that holds me back is this pervasive concern for myself traveling the world alone or to another country as a woman. I'm keeping it real, as a woman alone. I don't, and I've always wondered, is it the news that concerns me? Is it, what is it that I'm so worried about? Like, who's gonna take me as a hostage, you know? and put me on television with a bag over my head. It's like, it's sort of crazy, but it's so real. And while you were talking, I felt there's something about visibility here because it's also a strange thought that me, out of maybe 50,000 people, let's say every day who go to whatever, let's say I'm Spain, I wanna go to Spain and it's true. I'm arriving there, 50,000 other people are arriving the same day. Why me? Why would something even befall me? Why would somebody be in the airport going her, right? But this is something about being visible, going somewhere and being seen and heard in an environment that somehow, somewhere, even for a person like me who was traveling from the time I was like five years old, that there's suddenly this unsafety factor. Isn't that fascinating? Yes, yes. And f f so appreciating that you're sharing this in front of an audience, Debbie. And uh, this, like what just came up for you? And by the way, what are you feeling in your body in terms of like emotions or sensations just as this is arising? Okay, major sensations. Like the energy right now is huge pouring through me top to bottom bot top to bottom and out every side in a really good way i don't know about feelings but it's like so suddenly something turned a light on inside of me and the light had tremendous energy and it's like whoa what an awareness that's fascinating so that sounds like your response to the whatever's coming up but was there like a fear you know that came up related to the idea of traveling yeah, I would say that concern is a is a fear. Yeah. If I take my logic out of it because my logic's all over like, but it's it, but that's where I've been residing anyway. And then yeah. I want to create on top of it. Ah, yeah. let's go travel anyway. <laughs> yeah. So this is great cuz you know, you're so evolved, right? You've done so much work. You immediately start turning this into, you know, hey, there's a life lesson here and you know, we're going to go travel and uh, you know, find the silver lining to this and so forth. What I always say is before you overlay all, you know, the, the self-coaching and, and yeah. the, you know, the sort of the positive, let's, how, how can we take this in a positive direction? Pe when people do that, and by the way, I just say like, it's very evolved to do that like instantaneously. That's amazing that you can do that. Mm -hmm. But when people do that, 
they're missing out on the gold. I always tell people, before we bypass that too much, rewind and come back to what was there, that primal energy, because that's the doorway to something really valuable. And I, in my work with clients, I call it the treasure map because the stuff that comes up, people usually want to just shove it into the corner. Like, let's just push that out of the way because I'm really just trying to move towards the goal here. And when I'm working with clients, I'll tell them, no, that stuff that comes up, that's the gold, mm. right? That's perhaps your life mission is to transform or to shine a light on this part of you. Mm. And usually people will spend their entire lives avoiding shining a light on a particular aspect of their psyche. And when they do, that's actually the thing that's going to unlock them or unleash them the most. Duly noted and very true because getting out of the feeling, the feeling is where the nugget, where the transformation can happen. And I yes. concur. Yeah. And so you were asking me, you know, how do I do this inner freedom work? So mm -hmm. the first step is when someone has something that's very triggering, very reacting, that doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. as you said, why, you know, why should you have such a strong reaction to traveling when on your own, when you've been traveling since you're five, you're a veteran traveler and you're adventurous in many areas of life, anything that doesn't make sense and there's a strong trigger and a strong reaction, that's the doorway to some, you know, obviously some powerful healing, but something that's going to open up like some really new, you know, possibilities for people. Mm. And so that's why I like to start with a question. We kind of got there from the question, if I'm visible, then blank, right? So when I'm working with clients who have a visibility wound, that's one of the first questions they'll ask is if I'm, if you are visible, then blank, what will happen? And usually something pops right out for people. And generally speaking, it's in the category of then someone's going to hurt me. I'm going to get hurt in some way. God, so good. I just like really being with what you said. Yeah. And what we know is if we have a sense about that, that's real. Then why would we take that action if being hurt is the result? So your process then, because that's, I'm feeling that right now strongly. As I said, that hilarious thing about someone putting a bag over my head and putting me on television, but at the same time, illogically, there is, I think I've seen, and the funny thing is I don't really watch news. I'm very careful about what I allow into my space, but I have seen enough little snippets that it has made an impression. Okay, so what do you do next with your client? So next, we, so when we unearth there's something going on, there's a wound present, then the next step is to find out where it started. Okay, so to find the origin or the root cause. Okay, that's where the action is. Okay, mm -hmm. then we're, we're lifting up the rock and saying, where did it start? And, uh, you know, this is the part a lot of people don't do, right? Which is where did this all come from? And if you don't do that, then oftentimes uh, it's the, the work is more surface, you know, like, oh, I'm feeling this, you know, fear of being visible. You know, I'm going to listen to some guided meditations or you know, I'm going to read a book on, you know, how to overcome that uh, and so forth. But really, if you want to transform the deepest wounds, then you need to shine a light there. And, when I do that with people, you know, oftentimes there can be a little bit of a resistance or reluctance, like oh, what's down there in the basement. Uh, it's kind of like the movie Inception. Did you see the movie Inception? I did. Yeah. So there's, a, so there's that scene where Leo DiCaprio finds, he goes down this elevator into the basement and finds his wife there. And basically, I, I can't remember what happened if he wasn't able to save his wife, if she died and he wasn't able to save her or what it was, but basically... Right. There was a sense that he had done something to harm his wife and that pain of that was living in the basement of his psyche. Mm. And like, he couldn't let go of that pain from the past. So tell us your last two steps, because I also want to preface by letting the audience know, I mean, you can play with this at home clearly, but the reason why I want to preface whatever Patrick is going to say next is his process is way more in depth. Having experienced it, there are things that uh, we get to do with our hands and there are ways 
he uh, somatically guides us as well as it, it back into the past and to come forward and the actual healing work and what it entails. So even though these are words and it's a one, two, three, four, please understand it's way deeper. So if you want a session with him, then I recommend you do in a freedom process.com. You can reach out to him and get more information so you can experience it firsthand. So okay, Patrick steps three and four. Yeah. So, so then ultimately like this fear of being visible or whatever core wound there is, cause there's, you know, five different ones. Uh, it started somewhere. Usually someone wasn't born with a fear of being visible. Although it, it can happen to, there are certain situations where that, that does happen. Uh, but usually the fear of being visible comes sometime after birth, right? So we want to find out, well, where did that actually start from? And then reprogram the fear that got loaded into the system. You know, so, uh, so I actually work with a lot of clients who have a, a fear of being visible. And so uh, one of my clients was just telling me that uh, when she was four, her parents went through a messy divorce. And so she felt like because her parents were going through so much pain, and even though they kind of tried to hide it from her, you know, you can't hide what you can't hide all that emotionality and all the, uh, the acrimony, you know, from a child very easily. Right. And so she felt like it wasn't okay for her to express her needs or, uh, or to share her self-expression, you know, like here's like this thing she colored at school or, or she was wanting a new doll. She felt like she couldn't express herself because mm -hmm. her parents needed the support and it wasn't okay for her to ask for support when they were in such need of support. So she basically suppressed her needs. She suppressed her self-expression and basically did whatever she could to support them. Fast forward to her business life now, that's how she's still operating, right? So it's, she doesn't really express what she cares about. It's kind of a secret, right? She's all about trying to help other people but because she doesn't express what she cares about, what's, what her message is, you know, what she, the, her, the change she wants to create in the world, no one kind of knows about her. Uh, and she's so busy trying to help people, but she never tells them about the help she can actually provide. Mm. And so I call this the, uh, uh, the, the five-year-old MBA. <laughs> That's so good. Because we get we get our first business training usually somewhere around five, three, four, five, six. So she learned how to be a business owner when she was four, four to totally. five. Wow. Right. So to be okay as a human being, she needed to su suppress her self-expression, mm. not really be seen by her parents, kind of stay hidden and try to do her best to alleviate their pain. Okay. This is so prevalent for people who come from dysfunctional homes, by the way. I yes. hope like if people are resonating, right, right, right. Like really get into this because I know this one intimately too. And I see it in other people. If you come from dysfunction or alcoholism or whatever, that you part of learning to survive that is, well, one of the ways, but most of us on this in this tribe are that sensitive. We will learn to understand what other people want and need so we are safe and protected. So we're constantly scanning. We have this incredible gift to know all of what's going on. And if I do this, you're, you'll be fine, you'll be happy. And if I do that and et cetera, it's prevalent. And then when you go out into the world, you're still living from that pattern and service first, but there's very little service to self. This is such a big wound. Exactly. And uh, it doesn't even have to be that dysfunctional of a family. You know, a lot of my clients had an emotionally distant parent. Mm -hmm. So they would say, you know, there was nothing wrong with my childhood. You know, I wasn't abused and so forth. But a lack of connection or a, a sense of neglect yeah. is also a form of trauma. It's, you know, sometimes it's called invisible trauma. Mm. And so I know for me growing up, you know, one of my, the pattern, one of the patterns I learned was in order to sort of feel the love and affection of my dad, I learned to be really competent. You know, mm. it seemed like, it seemed like he liked it when I had good grades or when I did well, 
you know, at sports or I was in like the Y Indian guides, you know, kind of like the Boy Scouts, but like little Indians and so forth. So it seemed like when I accomplished something that seemed to like work well for the connection. And so I learned to be an A student. I learned to be good at extracurricular activities. And so sort of my mode, like, here's how I can get loved by people is by accomplishing things. Unfortunately, that's a super tenuous strategy because first of all, then you can never stop. You always have to be uh, doing stuff. Uh, then you also feel like you have to do everything right, right? Perfectionism <clears throat> comes out of this wound as well. Yeah. And then you can never rest because your whole, mm -hmm. your whole program is, I have to be doing and accomplishing to be loved. Big. So your client comes to you with this wound and, and how is she now? So basically this wound was, I call it the five-year-old MBA because she got trained how to operate with people at that age. And now that's the business. It's kind of like a training program. What you go through in childhood is a training program for life. You learn to operate as an adult from what the training program you went through in childhood. Mm -hmm. And so she, that training program is what now she's relying on in her business. And so what we did was we basically went back and reprogrammed or unwired the training program from when she was four. Okay. So we did some work inside and the work I do is basically sort of neuro uh, science based. So we're working with the programming in the unconscious that started in childhood because you got to go back to the source code, right? So with her, I went to the source code, what was going on when she was four, helped her unwire the program and basically have that program go to neutral. So mm -hmm. it's no longer driving her. And then we essentially installed a new program, mm -hmm. right? So, so a program where it's okay to assert her needs. It's okay to express things that she cares about. Okay. And so we basically installed this and it sounds a little abstract when I talk about it, but it's very sort of organic when we actually do it. And we basically installed a new program, a new wiring where she can express herself. She can move forward towards her needs. And then now in situations where it would make the most sense in the world for her to express her needs, she can do it because it's been reprogrammed inside essentially. So beautiful. Wow. <clears throat> Well, when we come back, I'll be talking to Patrick a little bit more about how this shows up. So what is procrastination or is that actually a visibility wound? And how can you stop constantly striving and instead move into something that actually serves and works for you? Well, this is Dare to Dream. I feature successful leaders who do outrageous major things in the world and really create their goals. And what if you knew that you couldn't fail? What if you knew that your alignment to be big and bold was going to allow you to be completely free? If you want to be part, and I invite you to be part of the Dare to Dream podcast, we are the number one transformation conversation available. You can help this show by donating a dollar or more, cup of coffee, or as much as you feel generous to do so, it will make a difference. Go to patreon.com slash dare to dream. You have a big purpose to fulfill. And at this show, I do everything to align to get you there. I bring on the best guests to support you to create what you came here to do. Go to patreon.com slash dare to dream. And if you're tuning in after we've started, I've got Patrick Dominguez here on Dare to Dream. He teaches people how to use the inner freedom process. So I do want to talk about that idea of procrastination versus visibility. How do people start to understand what camp they're in? What's actually going on? Yeah, great. I love that question. So, uh, so you know, in my 10 years of working with clients, I remember one of my first clients as a business coach, he came to our first session. And he said, I just have to let you know before we get started that I'm a self-sabotager. <laughs> it's great for a coach to hear. <laughs> and I was like, what does that even mean? <laughs> I'd never heard of that before. And so that was my introduction to the world of self-sabotage. And literally, I had no idea how to help him. And I basically let him go and said, you know, I suggest you find other resources because I didn't know how to work with self-sabotage at the time. Now, you know, I have the tools to work with that. And so self-sabotage, uh, 
procrastination. These all fall into the same bucket. Procrastination, self-sabotage, perfectionism, also continuously being unclear or lack of clarity where you, mm. someone never manages to get clear. These are all uh, self-protection mechanisms. So essentially, if you're never taking action, right, if you're procrastinating, if you're self-sabotaging, it also means you're not taking action. If you're not clear, it means you're not taking action. And so all of these things are ways to avoid taking action in your business, or if you're doing that in other areas of your life, it's to not take action in those areas. And essentially, there's like an inner equation that if I take action, something bad's gonna happen. I might fail. I might be seen as a fraud. I, you know, I might get hurt in some way. I might get judged, I might get rejected, okay? And so sometimes people will put a label like, oh, I'm just a procrastinator. And that's just putting like a little veneer over saying, I'm actually afraid. And uh, it's so much healthier actually to be able to say, you know what? Yeah, I'm procrastinating because I'm afraid because then you can actually get to the bottom of things. So usually these sorts of labels that people often use for themselves are just uh, another way of saying, yeah, I'm afraid. And how about like compulsions or addictions to working? I know there are addictions to working, but I guess what I mean, I think it's very prevalent right now. People who are like so driven have a to-do list like, they don't, they, I mean, I'll be honest, I don't wake up and see three things on my to-do list. It's like, poof, I'm always creating, always generating. And I am a generator in human design, so maybe that is part of it. But there's also the aspect of peace would be nice about now. Rest would be nice oh. about now. How can that be resolved? Yes. By the way, I just want to point out that, you know, we're talking about core wounds and so forth. And I want to just mention that, it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you to have core wounds. We all have them, first of all. Uh, and, you know, it's not like we're broken. It's just more we have a feeling inside that something's not right. Okay. So we often think like, we, you know, those of us who go through transformational work will hold a belief. Oh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm whole, complete and perfect. And of course, it's true. But it's more of a mental concept. And oftentimes, there's not a feeling inside of being whole and complete. Okay, so this drive, this compulsive drive to do that you're talking about, uh, definitely comes from a, a core wound. Uh, and basically, when you sit, and you know, for anyone listening here, if you sit with that compulsive drive, okay, so let's say you get up in the morning, and the first thing you want to do, and by the way, I've done a ton of healing for myself on this one. So I know, I, I, I know this one intimately, because I spent a year just getting connected with it. But if you get up in the morning or any time of the day where you're just like compulsively reaching for your to-do list and compulsively checking, how have you done? Pause, sit there with that compulsion and just be with that compulsion and feel into the bottom of that compulsion. And usually at the, at the core of it, there's anxiety. Ah, interesting. Okay. And if you, and the more, and to really get a feel for it, have your to-do list there, but don't look at it. Don't let <laughs> yourself look at it for like five or 10 minutes. Just let it be there. And like, I'm not going to look at it. I'm just going to sit here and relax. And it's impossible to relax. It's just like this craving. Yeah, I was going to say the triggers right there. Yeah. And so again, just like I said earlier in this, in this conversation, that's the doorway, right? Whatever is operating that, is having you be out of inner harmony and you can't control, that's a beautiful doorway to something, to, to inner freedom, to inner peace, if you're willing to look there and open the door, okay? So I've, I've also worked with clients who wanna have more ease and peace around their work. And the drive has positive aspects, but you can have the drive and motivation without that anxious compulsive energy and what I ask my clients to do is think about your day-to-day -day experience in your business. And oftentimes they'll notice, oh yeah, I feel like this constricted sort of compulsive, anxious energy all day long or a lot of their work day. And so we can not have that and still be productive and creative and so forth. I heard Kyle Cease speaking yesterday. I'm watching the series right now. And he was talking about <clears throat> how he meditates for two hours every morning. I've heard this before. And I'm saying it like that with a shrug because before I was like Teflon, 
right? I heard it, whatever. That's, that's amazing. And, but I heard it yesterday because after he talked about that he meditates for two hours, he was saying how many people look at him and say, God, how can you do that? How can you even factor in meditation? And he looks at them and says, how can you not? And it just hit me yesterday because I had this understanding in that moment, the profundity of what comes to somebody, even if it's only 20 minutes, the connection with the divine, the downloads, the peace, the becoming part of the all that is, and so much more. I suddenly had this really big revelation of the import of that. And I'm someone who strives to do it every day, but I have been trying to jam it here and there into my schedule and letting my schedule take the control and the reins as opposed to saying no, meditation first. So I'm really curious, Patrick, when you say this was big for you, you took a year, you found anxiety at the bottom of the barrel there. So what what was it besides, of course, your technique, obviously, but what have you employed uh, that has created something contrary for you out into the world? Where is it that you live now? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot more freedom around waking up in the morning and just being able to, you know, do my morning practices versus like having to get up, do things for two hours and then never actually getting to the morning practices. Right. So, you know, so I get up, you know, my morning practices, I get up, I smile. That's the first thing I do when I get, wake up in the morning. Mm. Uh, it's so great for your whole sort of energetic system, but just to smile, I'll have a glass of water. I take a walk. So pretty basic things. Uh, I might do a little bit of uh, inspirational reading. Mm -hmm. uh, but the whole thing was I had to, if, or at least in my experience, it really helped to rewire that compulsive desire to jump out of bed and do stuff. Yeah. Okay. It wasn't, it wasn't, I'm going to make this a really big priority and so forth. It was actually uh, healing the part of me that was feeling so driven so that I could actually choose something other than to just keep driving because uh, trying to override these sorts of patterns inside is very difficult because these patterns, like the compulsive doing, you know, it's running all the time. So you can stop it. You can really will yourself to stop it for a little while. Like, oh, I'm going to meditate, you know, for 20 minutes right now. But as soon as you're done meditating, you're like right back on that hamster wheel of doing. So I love I just, the idea of the morning practice. I, I have been, uh, since I got back from Costa Rica, I've been using YouTube on my smart TV and they have morning intentions. And I've been listening to that. And that's a beautiful, like beautiful to surround myself with. I, I do dry brushing every morning. I have to take a walk before I go to the gym because I've got a dog. And one of my practices is EFT tapping, which for me is tremendous. And um, I still feel that peace, that this, um, this connection with the divine, this silence, I guess, if you will, which is so the antithesis of the anxiety, but this silence, this just being is what I long for more of. Yes. Uh, I remember uh, when I was in college, I took this class in Buddhism and there was this metaphor of the, of the three veils. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that all of us inside have the Buddha nature, this sort of awakened uh, nature. And, but it's covered up by these three veils and the veils are uh, ignorance, attachment, and anger. Okay. And so when I was studying this in college, I always thought this was a metaphor. Uh, but what I've realized now, in, since I've been doing deep healing work, is the parts of us that are unhealed, right? The inner critic, the part of us that's compulsively doing, the part of us that's uh, afraid of being visible. These are like kind of like cloud layers over our inner sunshine. And the inner sunshine is that aspect of us that already knows how to be at peace and grounded and so forth. And so what I've found in, in doing this healing work is when you can kind of peel off these layers, these sort of layers that carry the anxiety, the fear and so forth, when you peel off the layers, what's left is 
basically like a shining Buddha nature. And I call it the inner freedom state. Some people call it a true self or higher self. But basically, uh, I studied uh, all the different people who talk about higher self, true self, and so forth. And everybody is talking about the exact same qualities. There's a state where you feel grounded, at peace, connected to unconditional love, connected to deeper wisdom. It's kind of like this whole like basket of different things that you get when you tap into the state. And what I find is when you heal the parts of us that feel sort of like lacking inside or when we have a hole inside and we heal that, it's just so much more automatic to have this, you know, deeper, you know, sort of true self, higher self experience. You don't have to kind of work for it. You just have easier access to it because there's fewer things sort of in the way between you and that state. Wow. I feel it as you describe it. I appreciate that so much because as I hear you say that, Patrick, if it already is, there's no place to go to access it. I already be that. It's just a matter. Um, I'm feeling into it as I say it, but if I know this to be true, it's really choice, right? So I can wake up and make a new choice. Now, I totally dig the part you're saying, like the healing work is kind of important, you know? So don't bypass that and try to repattern. Uh, but still, um, for me in the mornings, I, I really can be in choice. And I long to have that feeling. I know that right now more than ever, I'm really wanting that. So there's no accident that Kyle would say what he did yesterday and I'd hear something in a way I never had before that you're saying what you're saying and allowing me to understand I'm already that space. Everybody listening is already that space and that we can just choose that. And the modality can be different for all of us, but I, I really appreciate that beautiful point of view, the Buddha nature. It's ready here, golden Buddha nature. Yes, and I remember uh, for years, I was drawn to Buddhism and I would go to uh, Buddhist retreats and Dharma talks. And, you know, the, whoever was giving the talk, usually some, you know, beautiful Buddhist monk or nun would talk about how, you know, we have this shining Buddha nature inside and no striving is ever going to have you experience that. So you've probably heard that. So no striving, no teaching is ever going to give you that connection. And I remember once asking uh, one of the teachers, so then how do you have access to this, this state? And there wasn't really much of an answer other than, well, just let go of, you know, it's just about letting go of what's, you know, sort of in the way or on top of that. And it's sort of like what I said to the shaman in the fourth plant medicine ceremony. I'm like so tired of the intentions. I said, whatever's in the way, let's get rid of it. Bring it. <laughs> and so I, at, at a certain point, I got really frustrated in these spiritual you know, situations with spiritual teachings because there was teachings, but not really much how to. Like, so no striving is going to get there. Okay, I'm, I'm not striving now, but it doesn't seem like the Buddha nature is any more accessible. So, uh, and so my own path to more access to that Buddha nature experience is by letting go of the layers. It's like the cloud cover over the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, and so now I get why there's no striving, because when you let go of the parts that are kind of covering it up, the parts that are actually striving to have peace, when you actually allow, you know, more parts of your being to be at peace, then the Buddha nature, it kind of like is just uh, becomes available. So beautiful. Thank you. Well, folks, uh, right here at the end, if you're interested in connecting with Patrick, go to innerfreedomprocess.com. I've got also an exclusive for the Dare to Dream listeners, a unique deal with Thinkific available only to you where you can create, you can market, and you can sell your online courses. Best technology, best support, three months free of their business plan. Go to thnk.cc slash Deb, three months free. Patrick here at the end, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Uh, 
I'm feeling uh, so motivated right now, just so on fire to, uh, I, my, my dream is for the sort of healing work that we're talking about to go mainstream. So in the same way that, you know, just in our lifetime, yoga has gone fairly mainstream. Yes. Obviously, there's other aspects of yoga, but, you know, Hatha yoga has gone fairly mainstream. Uh, mindfulness and meditation has gone mainstream. Coaching has gone pretty mainstream. And so I'm out there in the world as an ambassador for healing to go mainstream. And I believe healing is the new coaching. It's the new personal development. Mm -hmm. It's the thing that people are going to coaching and personal development and spirituality for. They're craving something to change inside. And so, you know, I'm just spreading the word for people to, you know, look at those places inside where maybe it's a little scary to look because they're not as scary as you think. Mm -hmm. And they open a door to, you know, just amazing inner harmony, inner peace, and inner freedom. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. And if anyone would like to chat more or discover what your core wounds are and so forth, you can find me at my website. I'd love to talk to you. Otherwise, Debbie, you've been an amazing host. It's been such a great time talking with you. And thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Always, Patrick, the best. Well, I end today's show with this quote from Annette Messiger. Being an artist means forever healing your own wounds and at the same time, endlessly exposing them. Tune in to next week's show on Dare to Dream with my guest, Sherry Belul, who runs Simply Celebrate. Sherry has been seen on major television as she activates life's magic and shows us the best gifts that we can get for the people we love. Remember to subscribe to Dare to Dream, your number one transformation conversation. And if you're listening to this on podcast and you love it, and you really want to see what the guest looks like and see us animated talking together, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. And remember the secret of success is having the courage to begin in the first place. Thanks for being with us today.